Mick McCarthy, thank you for joining us here on Fan Republic and FAI TV as we look back to Italia 19. It's hard to believe, Mick, it's 30 years ago now. No, it is hard to believe. I was going to say, where, where has it all gone? But then I can see my head and my face in the uh, recording here. I know exactly where it's gone. 30 years ago, my face and hair loss. Uh, it's still memories, or still happy memories, and still quite vivid memories. <laughs> Not all of it, but uh, for the most part, and happy memories, of course. We spoke with Chris Hilton on FEI TV about Euro 88, which, of course, the anniversary this month as well. And Chris was making the point that that was the catalyst for everything that, that happened afterwards with the World Cups and European Championships and the qualification for a first ever tournament. But this World Cup qualification for that group of players, I mean, it was the icing on the cake for the nation and the players, wasn't it? It was, Carl, but you know what? It, it was... It was almost expected then after 88, and Chris is right, the catalyst was Euro 88. And of course, I think breaking that uh, hoodoo of never having qualified the first one you get there, then it, for some while it seems easier afterwards. Uh, certainly qualifying for 90 seven easier than 88, as we know it went to the last minutes with Bulgaria and Scotland, that one. Uh, we, we were a good team then. I think we knew we were a good team, a great set of lads. And I've spoken to, I spoke with Kaz there recently and I was in touch with uh, a few of the lads, Aldo and Kevin Moore. And just, I, I sent something around that had been sent to me that reminded us of it all. But it was the Put Under Pressure video. And all of them said, happiest times of their lives, best time of their career. And I'd, I'd agree with that. It was such a wonderful time. But we, we were a, we were a good team, I'm telling you. It was, we, we were a, a real, as, as it proved, of course, in the World Cup into the quarter final. But uh, the pressure was on in that one because we was, there was a lot more expected of us because of 88. You mentioned there about qualifying, and of course, the last game was a 2 0 win in Malta and John Aldridge breaking his international scoring goal. You didn't play in that game, Mick, but you were there for the party after. Uh, no, I didn't plan it. I, I was injured. I had a, a problem with my knee. I was, I was at Leon at the time, uh, and I was out of the team there. So, uh, but I, thankfully, Raymond Dominic, who was my coach at the time, allowed me to travel, and uh, Jack and uh, invited me over. It was great. Well, I mean, I was the captain of the team, but nevertheless, not always injured players getting to go to the games. But that was a real special, meaningful game, and uh, to be there. Um, the, the, the game was great because we qualified from it, but I have to say, the aftermatch party was something else in Malta. It was brilliant. It's not that far from Malta to, to Calgary, and you know, a few months later, a familiar foe in the first game of the World Cup, and England, of course. Yes, I've uh, I've seen. Of course, that's another anniversary that's been coming around '88. Uh, I've seen quite a bit of that. Shown again, and I've, I've spoke about it. Um, the uh, the game against England was uh, having played them once before, but then playing them there. Uh, I said pressure was on, you know. Pressure was on Jack. There was a different feel to that tournament in '90. The, the pressure was on because people expected us to do well. We 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 put pressure on ourselves to do well, and the build up to that game was a lot more tense than it had been to any other game. But that, of course, was as much to do with Jack as anybody else playing against his nation, his team, his country that he'd won a World Cup winner's medal with him. He's a hero there. Uh, it, it certainly was... The build-up was, yeah, a lot more intense, shall we say. And, of course, a great goal from Kevin Sheedy. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, Lineker had, had notched and got off the back of me I, that's, I've, I've been watching that since and I'm, I'm thinking yeah he's, he's done me there I'm thinking he's going to go in front of me he runs off the back of me and I still think I'm going to head that ball but Waddle put an amazing ball in and he started the score I'm still looking at I'm Chris Morris who will be tucking around me so I'm still I'm, I'm still analysing that goal all, all these years on but it was it was a real scrap on a, on a real wet an awfully wet night it was a damp ball Pitch wasn't great, but she scored a great goal to, to level it up, and it was a great result for us. You know, we, we weren't fancied. Like in 88, England was supposed to roll us over, but 
that, that was us. Nobody, nobody rolled us over, really. And your memories then, Mick, from the next game, Egypt, on that Sunday afternoon? <laughs> uh, not as memorable as the game before, that's for sure. Um, again, then, the expectancies there. And we'd seen how, I think, how hard work in Egypt were, solid they were, they sat back, they were belligerent. They had a couple of brothers, I think they were twins, I'm not sure if they are twins, but one played up front and he was a real threat and a real handful. And they, they kind of left... 10 behind the ball, left him up front uh, and he'd run and he'd challenge and he'd chase and we had a lot of it we had to play in front of them and actually they'd obviously watched us we couldn't turn him around and get him behind them and so it turned out, it turned out to be a real disappointing performance and a disappointing result of course to draw 0-0 against them and then you know as I said before the, the expectancy the pressure the, uh, the aftermath of that game was that you know, we, we haven't played very well and we got a lot of stick from it. Um, you know, 30 years on, probably de deservedly so. We should have beaten them. But you have to give credit to the opposition as well sometimes if they, uh, they can defend for 95 minutes. Holland, of course, were next up. And, and as yourself and Ruth Holders, as captains, there was a, a little bit of a deal done about a draw, was there? Or is that a, a common myth? No, that's true. But, I, you know, there's... Probably five minutes to go. The time people said to me that was 15 minutes, and I said, No, it wasn't. It was the last few minutes of the game, probably the last five minutes. And I, I had asked the question, What's happening? And by the way, for 85 minutes, that had been a humdinger of the game. We'd been slugging it out, and uh, I said to him, Look, we're both going through. And uh, he was quite happy with that. He told his teammates, I told mine. Although I have to say, uh, Marco van Basten wasn't happy with it. He suddenly wanted to play football. He'd, he'd barely had a kick for 85 minutes, but now when we were, when it was getting nice and easy, he wanted to score the goal, of course. Uh, but what I didn't realise is that the message I got, so I think it was Kaz and Quinny who flumped still at the time. And uh, they were, our two centre forwards were bashing their centre backs when we were kicking it up to them. But the rest, I mean, look, it, it, it wasn't as bad as it sounded. We just. We, we, we accepted the result and, and I remember we were passing the ball about and the referee came and pulled me and Ruud Hullet together and said, look, you've got to play You've got to play the game, I've got to play football. And I said, I knew there was a French referee who refereed me in Lyon. And I said, ref, I said, this is the uh, this is the most football we've played in the tournament. We were silky passing it between one another and then kicking it to them and they kicking it to us. But... Uh, it worked out even better for us because we got Romania and they got Germany, I believe, and went up to him. We're going to talk about Genoa now. I mean, the whole country had gone World Cup mad at this stage and half the country descended on Genoa for that game against Romania. I mean... Oh, the... Uh, you know, just the uh, the fact that when we, when we drew, having I mean, gone 1-0 down against Holland, they're getting a draw out of it. Uh, and... The celebrations and going and going to through into the last sixteen to play Romania from everywhere, and we were getting messages from home. You know, people travelling, selling up, coming out to Italy to watch the games. The the build up to that was was amazing. We we went out to uh, stayed in the Royal Bristol Hotel, I think, in uh, Portofino. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, no, Rapallo, Rapallo, and uh, lap lap of luxury, lap of luxury from. Borderline, I was going to say Kips, that'd be a bit, that'd be a bit strong. But uh, not the best hotels that we've been staying in, let me tell you, the best facilities. Uh, and when we when we turned up there, we were at Scotland had been there for the group, three group games, I believe. And of course, uh, me and all the lads are saying, oh, what about this? Scotland have been staying here and we're all having a bit of a whinge at white footballers do. And uh, Jack said, yeah. And they're bloody going home. That's probably why, because they've stayed in here in the lap of luxury. So uh, his point was made, and we just got on with it. But it, it was an amazing place. It really was. The hotel, training ground, it was a bit different to some of the stuff we have been having. And then the game itself, and of course, Haji was pulling all the strokes that day for Romania. Amazing play. I've still got his shirt in the garage, and I always joke, I'm sure it's still moving. Even though I go and look at it now. Um, I have, a, I have a box full of the shirts that I, uh, I swap 
with, uh, with with the opposition. He was amazing. One of the best players I've ever played against. Um, you couldn't go anywhere near him. I mean, play, you know, we're playing four four two predominantly. I mean, thinking back now, I don't see too many teams doing that in the World Cup. And uh, he would be dropping in behind the strike and playing whatever he wanted, picking it up, spraying balls everywhere. I remember him peppering Packy's goal with shots, and Packy made some great saves. Uh, but yeah, an amazing player. You know, we, that, that day was incredibly hot as well. So I'm not so sure the way we played, it certainly wasn't conducive for us to get around the pitch and do what we've done in the past. Although, as we always did, we tried. The last. The half an hour of extra time, though, was pretty much a non-event. I think they were all knackered. We certainly were all knackered. And it was... Uh, nobody wanted to lose that in extra time. And I don't know. Maybe Romania thought they could beat us on penalties. and Unfortunately for them, they didn't. But fortunately for us, we won. It was brilliant. And as you say, Packy saved the best to last. Yeah, he, he had a great... He, look, he had a great World Cup. He was a great goalkeeper, Packy. Uh, you know, he gets remembered for that said, but what about all his, his contributions prior to that to get us to Euro 88, to get us to Euro, uh, World Cup 90, playing against England, made some saves, uh, certainly playing against Holland, he, he was just a top class keeper and uh, it, it's it's fitting for him that he, that he saved you and then he, then he had all the, the congrats and the publicity and, and since he's known for that save and he, and he, de he deserves that fame and notoriety for it because he was brilliant and he's such a he's a lovely humble guy as well and of course with his save and David O'Leary's goal you get to go to Rome and Mick Bourne gets to meet the Pope <laughs> yeah uh, yes Monsignor Boyle was it, was it, was it was, I think he was uh, who was with us on a regular basis and between uh, Charlie, Charlie O'Leary and Mick Byrne I think they concocted a trip to go and see the Pope which was something else really you know? but even then when we turned up in Rome for these games we all got to our rooms and I'm telling you there were, there were like single rooms with two single beds in and I remember Packy and Jerry Payton putting their bags down there was nowhere to sleep so that was a bit of a, an iffy start towards the quarter final because we ended up throwing everybody else out of the hotel and we ended up having a, a room each so we could actually sleep and have our gear in. Uh, so that wasn't the best start to it. But of course, as always with us, once that was sorted out, we got on with it. We went we went to the Vatican to see the Pope, thinking that... And it was amazing. Just walking around it was amazing. And I've never been back since, and it's a place I'd love to go and see it on my own or with the owner, of course. Uh, so the whole day was it was just a great trip but then well, I think we thought we were meeting the Pope we were audience with the Pope I thought it, we thought it was just us but of course we are in this auditorium with about 5,000 people in it uh, and he was uh, giving us all a blessing and a speech And but we were sat on the stage and then he, he came across to us and I, had to pre I presented as the captain got a shirt to present him Charlie O'Leary we met him and McBurn and we're all everybody was trying to get to, to shake his hand it was, it was just a lovely, lovely touch, that one that we all appreciated. Um, and then we were ready for the uh, for the quarter-final, of course. You've always said, mate, that was one of the proudest moments of your career, wasn't it? Oh, it is. It's the, the proudest moment, leading, leading my country down the stairs as a, as a captain in a quarter-final of a World Cup for Ireland was it's still off the scale, that with me. Uh, and it, so it was the best moment of my life and footballing career. And probably the worst in terms of when we lost afterwards uh, because we played so well in it and we thought we could win it. We absolutely thought we were going to win it. And that's... Uh, we weren't arrogant, not at all. We were confident. We believed in ourselves. We believed in each other. And we thought, you know, I guess the... Uh, epicentre of Italian football in Rome, uh, almost into the Colosseum playing the home uh, the home nation and we, we still thought we'd win. And but for Scalacci maybe and a little bit of good fortune on their part and a little bit of bad luck on ours because it was a good game and we played well. 
the result might have been different. Um, so, so one, yeah, proudest moment of my football career, best moment. You came home from that trip to an incredible reception in Dublin. Yeah, well, we'd had one in '88, and which was right off the cuff, but '90 was just, you know, unbelievable stuff, really. Um, in those those two years, '88 and '90, sort of through Jack, through the football team, um, through the what happened, kind of lifted the nation. I thought and helped in, in every aspect, and it certainly put a smile on people's faces. And to have had football doing so well in, in major tournaments and certainly in the World Cup. I mean, I think it caught everybody's imagination. Um, yeah, one of the stories, Con Houlihan. I think Con wrote, somebody wrote, I thought it was him, I'm attributing to him anyway because he was a great guy. And he said he'd missed, he'd, uh, he'd missed the World Cup because he was in Italy. He thought it was, there was a better occasion going on in Ireland with everything that was going on. And it, and, it, and it continued when we got back. It was an amazing reception. It was uh, it was wonderful. That bus journey down into Dublin. We celebrated Jack Charlton's 85th birthday recently on FEI TV, etc. And, and you know we can't say goodbye to Italian 90 without a tribute to Jack because that summer, make over those two years, but that summer in particular, so many people's lives were changed. Yeah, there were. I said, I think it had a real positive effect on, on, on a lot of people and on the country as a whole. Certainly, and, and on as, as players as us. And, and the fact that we're now still talking about it 30 years on uh, shows what it meant to, to everybody, to the FAI, to the to football, to people in Ireland, to me, to all the players who played there. Uh, and I spoke, to, I spoke to Jack briefly, recently, on, his, on his, the day after his birthday, actually. Uh, just briefly, because it's not easy speaking to him at the moment. I spoke to Pat, his wife, and really just told her what I couldn't really tell him, that how much we, all of us, benefited from his presence. I'm talking about me, the players, everybody who was involved in him, with him, uh, and how it was the happiest times of our life. And that uh, me certainly love the bones of him. And Pat was there as well. We, we used to have great times together. And I think if you asked every other player, they'd tell you that they loved him. The win of the World Cup, and and just enjoyed. It was it was so much pleasure we derived from it, and it, it, it you know you, you play football and enjoy it anyway. But this was just an incredible moment in time for me and for all the other players. And it was down to Jack, you know, he, he got the players together, he set the rules, he set the tone, he set what we we're going to do, and we all did it. And if uh, well, as you know, if you didn't do it, you didn't play. But, and, he, and, he, and he should be remembered for more than being, I don't know, sometimes he gets remembered as this, you know, big belligerent, tells everybody what to do. He was so clever, so cute, so tactically aware at that time as us. He knew what, how he wanted to play, what system he wanted to play, what players played in it. And he got the best out of us and we all benefited from it. So, yeah, it was wonderful.